Coffee Break Collection 15, The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devora Allen. Bad Case of Ergophobia. Men in England even went to sleep while being sentenced. Special Cable to the New York Times. London, October 12th. Some Britons believe this tight little island holds a record that even America will not dispute, that of possessing the laziest man in the world, in the person of one Chilcot, who the other day slept peacefully in the dock of a London suburban criminal court while the presiding justice considered what he should do with him. After being loudly asked several times if he had anything to say, he opened one eye reproachfully at the recorder, yawned, sighed, no, and relapsed into slumber. On one occasion, Chilcott was heard to say that he had never done a voluntary hour's work in his life. This oratical effort so fatigued him, he did not utter a word for the rest of the day. His conversation usually consists of reluctant yeses and noes, and he is the despair of nearly every workhouse master in the country. He was examined by Dr. Wilson, who diagnosed the disease which had attacked him as ergophobia, fear of work. Chilcott, for three months past, has been under remand at the Wandsworth Jail, where the officials have had great difficulty in inducing him even to move. He is a big, heavy man. The prosecuting counsel said the prisoner was so lazy that he would not take the trouble to walk, and had to be pushed about, even had to be pushed into the dock. Chilcott was awakened to hear the recorder sentence him, but as the magistrate began to read him a lecture, he dropped off to sleep before he heard that he had been condemned to twelve months' imprisonment with hard labor. End of Bad Case of Ergophobia Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Descent of Man by Edith Wharton Chapter 6 The professor all the while was leading a double life. While the author of The Vital Thing reaped the fruits of popular approval, the distinguished microscopist continued his laboratory work unheeded, save by the few who were engaged in the same line of investigations. His divided allegiance had not hitherto affected the quality of his work. It seemed to him that he returned to the laboratory with greater zest after an afternoon in a drawing-room, where readings from the vital thing had alternated with plantation melodies and tea. He had long ceased to concern himself with what his colleagues thought of his literary career. Of the few whom he frequented, none had referred to the vital thing and he knew enough of their lives to guess that their silence might as fairly be attributed to indifference as to disapproval. They were intensely interested in the professor's views on beetles, but they really cared very little what he thought of the Almighty. The professor entirely shared their feelings, and one of his chief reasons for cultivating the success which accident had bestowed on him was that it enabled him to command a greater range of appliances for his real work. He had known what it was to lack books and instruments, and the vital thing was the magic wand which summoned them to his aid. For some time he had been feeling his way along the edge of a discovery, balancing himself with professional skill on a plank of hypothesis flung across an abyss of uncertainty. The conjecture was the result of years of patient gathering of facts. Its corroboration would take months more of comparison and classification. But at the end of the vista, victory loomed. The professor felt within himself that assurance of ultimate justification which, to the man of science, makes a lifetime seem the mere comma between premise and deduction. But he had reached the point where his conjectures required formulation. It was only by giving them expression, by exposing them to the common and criticism of his associates, that he could test their final value and this inner assurance was confirmed by the only friend whose confidence he invited. Professor Pease, the husband of the lady who had opened Mrs. Linyard's eyes to the triumph of the vital thing, was the repository of her husband's scientific experiences. 
what he thought of the vital thing had never been divulged, and he was capable of such vast exclusions that it was quite possible that pervasive work had not yet reached him. In any case, it was not likely to affect his judgment of the author's professional capacity. You want to put that all in a book, Lindyard, was Professor Peace's summing up. I'm sure you've got hold of something big, but to see it clearly yourself you ought to outline it for others. Take my advice. Chuck everything else and get to work tomorrow. It's time you wrote a book anyhow. It's time you wrote a book anyhow. The words smote the professor with mingled pain and ecstasy. He could have wept over their significance. But his friend's other phrase reminded him with a start of harvest. You have got hold of a big thing. It had been the publisher's first comment on the vital thing. But what a world of meaning lay between the two phrases. It was the world in which the powers who fought for the professor were destined to wage their final battle and for the moment he had no doubt of the outcome. The next day he went to town to see Harvis. He wanted to ask for an advance on the new popular edition of The Vital Thing. He had determined to drop a course of supplementary lectures at the university, and to give himself up for a year to his book. To do this, additional funds were necessary. But, thanks to The Vital Thing, they would be forthcoming. The publisher received him as cordially as usual, but the response to his demand was not as prompt as his previous experience had entitled him to expect. Of course, we'll be glad to do what we can for you, Lanyard, but the fact is we've decided to give up the idea of the new edition for the present. You've given up the new edition? Why, yes, we've done pretty well by the vital thing, and we're inclined to think it's your turn to do something for it now. The professor looked at him blankly. "'What can I do for it?' he asked. "'What more?' his accent added. "'Why, put a little new life in it by writing something else. The secret of perpetual motion hasn't been discovered, you know, and it's one of the laws of literature that books which start with a rush are apt to slow down sooner than the crawlers. We've kept the vital thing going for eighteen months, but, hang it, it ain't so vital any more.' We simply couldn't see our way to a new edition. Oh, I don't say it's dead yet, but it's moribund, and you're the only man who can resuscitate it. The professor continued to stare. I... What can I do about it? He stammered. Do? Why write another like it? Go it one better. You know the trick. The public isn't tired of you by any means, but you want to make yourself hurt again before anybody else cuts in. Write another book. Write two and we'll sell them in sets in a box. The Vital Thing series. That will take tremendously in the holidays. Try and let us have a new volume by October. I'll be glad to give you a big advance if you'll sign a contract on that. The professor sat silent. There was too cruel an irony in the coincidence. Harvest looked up at him in surprise. Well... What's the matter with taking my advice? You're not going out of literature, are you? The professor rose from his chair. No, I'm going into it, he said simply. Going into it? I'm going to write a real book, a serious one. Good Lord, most people think the vital thing serious. Yes, but I mean something different. In your old line, beetles and so forth? Yes said the professor solemnly. Harvest looked at him with equal gravity. Well, I'm sorry for that, he said, because it takes you out of our bailiwick. But I suppose you've made enough money out of the vital thing to permit yourself a little harmless amusement. When you want more cash, come back to us. Only don't put it off too long or some other fellow will have stepped into your shoes. Popularity don't keep, you know, and the hotter the success, the quicker the commodity perishes. He leaned back, cheerful and sententious, delivering his axioms with conscious kindliness. The professor, who had risen and moved to the door, turned back with a wavering step. When did you say another volume would have to be ready, he faltered. I said October, but call it a month later. You don't need any pushing nowadays. And you'd have no objection to letting me have a little advance now? 
I need some new instruments for my real work. Harvis extended a cordial hand. My dear fellow, that's the talking. I'll write the check while you wait, and I dare say we can start up the cheap edition of The Vital Thing at the same time, if you'll pledge yourself to give us the book by November. How much? he asked, poised above his checkbook. In the street the professor stood staring about him, uncertain and a little dazed. After all, it's only putting it off for six months, he said to himself, and I can do better work when I get my new instruments. He smiled and raised his hat to the passing Victoria of a lady in whose copy of the vital thing he had recently written, Labor es etiam ipsa voluptus. End of the Descent of Man Recording by Philip Gould Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In a Coal Mine by Eva March Tappan Did you ever wonder how beds of coal happened to be in the earth? This is their story. Centuries ago, so many thousand centuries that even the most learned men can only guess at their number, strange things were coming to pass. The air was so moist and cloudy that the sun's rays had hard work to get through. It was warm, nevertheless, for the crust of the earth was not nearly so thick as it is now, and much heat came from the earth itself. Many plants and trees grow best in warm, moist air, and such plants flourished in those days. Some of their descendants are living now, but they are dwarfs, while their ancestors were giants. There is a little horsetail growing in our meadow, and there are ferns and club mosses almost everywhere. These are some of the descendants, but many of their ancestors were forty or fifty feet high. They grew very fast, especially in swamps, and when they died, there was no lack of others to take their places. Dead leaves fell and heaped up around them. Stumps stood and decayed, just as they do in our forest today. Every year the soft, black, decaying mass grew deeper. As the crust of the earth was so thin, it bent and wrinkled easily. It often sank in one place and rose in another. When these low, swampy places sank, water rushed over them, pressing down upon them with a great weight and sweeping in sand and clay. Now if you burn a heap of wood in the open air, the carbon in the wood burns and only a pile of ashes remain. Burning means that the carbon in the wood unites with the oxygen gas in the air. If you cover the wood before you light it, so that only a little oxygen reaches it, much of the carbon is left in the form of charcoal. When wood decays, its carbon unites with the oxygen in the air, and so decay is really a sort of burning. In the forests of today, the leaves, and at length the trees themselves, fall and decay in the open air. But at the time when our coal was forming, the water kept the air away and much carbon was left. This is the way coal was made. Some of the layers, or strata, are fifty or sixty feet thick, and some are hardly thicker than paper. On top of each one is a stratum of sandstone or dark grey shale, this was made by the sand and mud which were brought in by the water. These shaly rocks split easily into sheets and show beautiful fossil impressions of ferns. There are also impressions of the bark and fruit of trees, together with shells, crinoids, corals, remains of fishes and flying lizards, and some few trilobites, crab-like animals with a shell somewhat like the back of a lobster, but marked into three divisions or lobes, from which its name comes. Since the crust of the earth was so thin and yielding, it wrinkled up as the earth cooled, much as the skin of an apple wrinkles when the apple dries. This brought some of the strata of coal to the surface, and after a while people discovered that it would burn. If a vein of coal cropped out on a man's farm, he broke some of it up with his pickaxe, shoveled it into his wheelbarrow, and wheeled it home. After a while, hundreds of thousands of people wanted coal, and now it had to be mined. In some places, the coal stratum was horizontal and cropped out on the side of a hill, 
so that a level road could be dug straight into it. In other places, the coal was so near the surface that it could be quarried under the open sky, just as granite is quarried. Generally, however, if you wish to visit a coal mine, you go to a shaft, a square black well sometimes deeper than the height of three or four ordinary church steeples. You get into the cage, a great steel box, and are lowered down, down, down. At last the cage stops and you are at the bottom of the mine. The miner's faces, hands, overalls are all black with coal dust. They wear tiny lamps on their caps, and as they come near the walls of coal, it sparkles as it catches the light. Here and there hangs an electric lamp. It is doing its best to drive out light, but its glass is thick with coal dust. The low roof is held up by stout wooden timbers and pillars of coal. A long passageway stretches off into a blacker darkness than you ever dreamed of. Suddenly there is a blaze of red light far down the passage, a roar, a medley of all sorts of noises, the rattling of chains, the clattering of couplings, the shouts of men, the crash of coal falling into the bins. It is a locomotive dragging its line of cars loaded with coal. In a few minutes it rushes back with empty cars to have them refilled. All along this passageway are rooms, that is, chambers, which have been made by digging out the coal. Above them is a vast amount of earth and rock, sometimes hundreds of feet in thickness. There is always danger that the roof will cave in, and so the rooms are not made large, and great pillars of coal are left to hold up the roof. Not many years ago the miner used to do all the work with his muscles. Now machines do most of it. The miner then had to lie down on his side near the wall of coal in his room and cut into it, close to the floor, as far as his pickaxe would reach. Then he bored a hole into the top of the coal, pushed in a cartridge, thrust in a slender squib, lighted it and ran for his life. The cartridge exploded and perhaps a ton or two of coal fell. The miner's helper shoveled this into a car and pushed it out of the room to join the long string of cars. That is the way mining used to be done. In these days, a man with a small machine for cutting coal comes first. He puts his cutter on the floor against the wall of coal and turns on the electricity. Chip, chip, grinds the machine, eating its way swiftly into the coal, and soon there is a deep cut all along the side of the room. The man and his machine go elsewhere, and the first room is left for its next visitors. They come in the evening and bore holes for the blasting. Once these holes were bored by hand, but now they are made with powerful drills that work by compressed air. A little later other men come and set off cartridges. In the morning when the dust has settled and the smoke has blown away, the loaders appear with their shovels and load the coal into the cars. Then it is raised to the surface and made ready for market. Did you ever notice that some pieces of coal are dull and smutty, while others are hard and bright? The dull coal is called bituminous, because it contains more bitumen or mineral pitch. This is often sold as run-of-the-mine coal, that is, just as it comes out from the mine, whether in big pieces or in little ones. But sometimes it is passed over screens, and in this process the dust and smaller bits drop out. The second kind of coal, the sort that is hard and bright, is anthracite. Its name is connected with a Greek word meaning ruby. It burns with a glow, but does not blaze. Most of the anthracite coal is used in houses, and householders will not buy it unless the pieces are of nearly the same size and free from dirt, coal dust and slate. The work of preparation is done in odd-shaped buildings called breakers. One part of a breaker is often a hundred or a hundred and fifty feet in height. The coal is carried to the top of the breaker. From there it makes a journey to the ground, but something happens to it every little way. It goes between rollers which crush it, then over screens through which the smaller pieces fall. Sometimes the screens are so made that the coal will pass over them, while the thin, flat pieces of slate will fall through. In spite of all this, bits of coal mixed with slate sometimes slide down with the coal, and these are picked out by boys. A better way of getting rid of them is now coming into use. 
This is to put the coal and slate into moving water. The slate is heavier than the coal and sinks, and so the coal can easily be separated from it. Dealers have names for the various sizes of coal. Egg must be between two and two and five eighths inches in diameter. Nut between three fourths and one and one eighth inches. P between one half and three fourths of an inch. Mining coal is dangerous work. Any blow of the pickaxe may break into a vein of water which will burst out and flood the mine. The wood props which support the roof may break, or the pillars of coal may not be large enough, and the roof may fall in and crush the workers. There are always poisonous gases. The coal, as has been said before, was made under water, and therefore the gas which was formed in the decaying leaves and wood could not escape. It is always bubbling out from the coal, and at any moment a pickaxe may break into the hole that is full of it. One kind of gas is called choke damp, because it chokes or suffocates anyone who breathes it. There is also white damp, the gas which you see burning with a pretty blue flame over a hot coal fire. Worst of all is the fire damp. If you stir up the water in a marsh, you will see bubbles of it rise to the surface. It is harmless in a marsh, but quite the opposite in a mine. When it unites with a certain amount of air, it becomes explosive, and the least bit of flame will cause a terrible explosion. Even coal dust may explode if the air is full of it, and it is suddenly set in motion by too heavy a blast of powder. Miners used to work by candlelight. Everyone knew how dangerous this was, but no one found any better way until, about a hundred years ago, Sir Humphrey Davy noticed something which other people had not observed. He discovered that flame would not pass through fine wire gauze, and he made a safety lamp in which a little oil lamp was placed in a round funnel of wire gauze. The light, but not the flame, would pass through it, and all safety lamps that burn oil have been made on this principle. The electric lamp, however, is now in general use. The miner wears it on his cap, and between his shoulders he carries a small, light storage battery. Even with safety lamps, however, there are sometimes explosions. The only way to make a mine at all safe from dangerous gases is to keep it full of fresh, pure air. There is no wind to blow through the chambers and passages, and therefore air has to be forced in. One way is to keep a large fire at the bottom of the air shaft. If you stand on a stepladder, you will feel that the top of the room is much warmer than the floor. This is because hot air rises, and in a mine, the hot air over the fire rises and sucks the foul air and gas out of the mine, and fresh air rushes in to take its place. Another way is by a fan, a machine that forces fresh air into the mine. So it is that by hard work and much danger we get coal for burning. Now coal is dirty and heavy, a coal fire is hard to kindle and hard to put out, and the ashes are decidedly disagreeable to handle. And, after all, we do not really burn the coal itself, but only the gas from it, which results from the union of carbon and oxygen. In some places, natural gas, as it is called, which comes directly from some storehouse in the ground, is used in stoves and furnaces and fireplaces, for both heating and cooking. And perhaps before long gas will be manufactured so cheaply and can be used so safely and comfortably that we shall not have to burn coal at all, but can use gas for all purposes, unless electricity should take its place. End of In a Coal Mine by Eva March Tappan Coffee Break Collection 15. The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. London Dock. Extract from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Published in 1851. The London Dock area occupies an area of 90 acres and is situated in the three parishes of St. George, Shadwell and Wapping. The courts and alleys round about the dock swarm with low lodging houses and are inhabited either by the dock labourers, sack makers, watermen 
or that peculiar class of the London poor who pick up a living by the waterside. The open streets themselves have all more or less a maritime character. Every other shop is either stocked with gear for the ship or for the sailor. The windows of one house are filled with quadrants and bright brass sextants, chronometers and huge mariner's compasses, with their cards trembling with the motion of the cabs and wagons passing in the street. Then comes the sailor's cheap shoe mart, rejoicing in the attractive sign of Jack and his mother. Every public house is a jolly tar or something equally taking. Then come sail makers, their windows stowed with ropes and lines smelling of tar. All the grocers are provision merchants and exhibit in their windows the cases of meat and biscuits and every article is warranted to keep in any climate. The corners of the streets, too, are mostly monopolised by slop-sellers, their windows part-coloured with bright red and blue fannel shirts, the doors nearly blocked up with hammocks and well-oiled nor'westers, and the front of the house itself nearly covered with canvas trousers, rough pilot coats, and shiny black dreadnoughts. The passengers alone would tell you that you were in the maritime districts of London. Now you meet a satin waistcoated mate, or a black sailor with his large fur cap, or else a custom house officer in his brass button jacket. As you enter the dock, the sight of the forest of masts in the distance, and the tall chimneys vomiting clouds of black smoke, and the many coloured flags flying in the air, has a most peculiar effect while the sheds with the monster wheels arching through the roofs look like the paddle-boxes of huge steamers. Along the quay you see now men with their faces blue with indigo, and now gaugers with their long brass-tipped rule, dripping with spirit from the cask they have been probing. Then will come a group of flaxen-haired sailors chattering German, and next a black sailor with a cotton handkerchief twisted turban-like round his head. Presently a blue smocked butcher, with fresh meat and a bunch of cabbages in the tray on his shoulder, and shortly afterwards a mate with green parakeets in a wooden cage. Here you will see, sitting on a bench, a sorrowful-looking woman, with new bright cooking tins at her feet, telling you she is an emigrant preparing for her voyage. As you pass along this quay the air is pungent with tobacco. On that it overpowers you with the fumes of rum. Then you are nearly sickened with the stench of hides and huge bins of horns, and shortly afterwards the atmosphere is fragrant with coffee and spice. Nearly everywhere you meet stacks of cork or else yellow bins of sulphur or lead-coloured copper ore. As you enter this warehouse, the flooring is sticky, as if it had been newly tarred with the sugar that has leaked through the casks, and as you descend into the dark vaults, you see long lines of lights hanging from the black arches, and lamps flitting about midway. Here you sniff the fumes of the wine, and there the peculiar fungus smell of dry rot. Then the jumble of sounds as you pass along the dock blends in anything but sweet concord. The sailors are singing boisterous nigger songs from the Yankee ship just entering. The cooper is hammering at the cusks on the quay. The chains of the cranes, loosed of their weight, rattle as they fly up again. The ropes splash in the water. Some captain shouts his orders through his hands. A goat bleats from some ship in the basin. And empty casks roll along the stones with a heavy, drum-like sound. Here the heavily laden ships are down far below the quay, and you descend to them by ladders. Whilst in another basin they are high up out of the water, so that their green copper sheathing is almost level with the eye of the passenger. While above his head a long line of bowsprits stretches far over the quay, and from them hang spars and planks as a gangway to each ship. He who wishes to behold one of the most extraordinary and least known scenes of this metropolis should wend his way to the London dock gates at half-past seven in the morning. There he will see, congregated within the principal entrance, masses of men of all grades, looks, and kinds. Some in half-fashion surtout burst at the elbows, with the dirty shirts showing through. Others in greasy sporting jackets with red pimpled faces. Others in the rags of their half-slang gentility, with the velvet collars of their paltot worn through to the canvas. 
some in rusty black, with their waistcoats fastened tight up to the throat, others again with the knowing thieves curl on each side of the jaunty cap, whilst here and there you may see a big-whiskered pole with his hands in the pockets of his pleated French trousers. Some loll outside the gates, smoking the pipe which is forbidden within, but these are mostly Irish. Presently you know by the stream pouring through the gates and the rush towards particular spots that the calling foremen have made their appearance. Then begins the scuffling and scrambling forth of countless hands high in the air to catch the eye of him whose voice may give them work. As the foreman calls from a book of names, some men jump up on the backs of the others so as to lift themselves high above the rest and attract the notice of him who hires them. All are shouting. Some cry aloud his surname, some his Christian name, others call out their own names to remind him that they are there. Now the appeal is made in Irish Blarney, now in broken English. Indeed, it is a sight to sadden the most callous, to see thousands of men struggling for only one day's hire, the scuffle being made the fiercer by the knowledge that hundreds out of the number there assembled must be left to idle the day out in want. To look in the faces of that hungry crowd is to see a sight that must be ever remembered. Some are smiling to the foreman to coax him into remembrance of them. Others, with their protruding eyes, eager to snatch at the hoped-for pass. For weeks many have gone there and gone through the same struggle, the same cries, and have gone away, after all, without the work they had screamed for. From this it might be imagined that the work was of a peculiarly light and pleasant kind, and so when I first saw the scene I could not help imagining myself. But in reality the labour is of that heavy and continuous character, which you would fancy only the best fed could stand it. The work may be divided into three classes. One, wheel work, or that which is moved by the muscles of the legs and weight of the body. Two, jigger or winch work, or that which is moved by the muscles of the arm. In each of these the labourer is stationary. But in the truck work, which forms the third class, the labourer has to travel over a space of ground greater or less in proportion to the distance which the goods have to be removed. The wheel work is performed somewhat on the system of the tread wheel, with the exception that the force is applied inside instead of outside the wheel. From six to eight men enter a wooden cylinder or drum, upon which are nailed battens, and the men laying hold of the ropes commence treading the wheel round, occasionally singing the while, and stamping time in a manner that is pleasant from its novelty. The wheel is generally about sixteen feet in diameter and eight to nine feet broad, and the six or eight men treading within it will lift from sixteen to eighteen hundred weight and often a ton forty times in an hour, an average of twenty-seven feet high. Other men will get out a cargo of from eight hundred to nine hundred casks of wine, each cask averaging about five hundred weight, and being lifted about eighteen feet in a day and a half. At trucking, each man is said to go on an average thirty miles a day, and two-thirds of that time he is moving one and a half hundredweight at six miles and a half per hour. This labour, though requiring to be seen to be properly understood, must still appear so arduous that one would imagine it was not of that tempting nature that three thousand men could be found every day in London desperate enough to fight and battle for the privilege of getting two shillings and sixpence by it, and even if they fail in getting taken on at the commencement of the day, that they should then retire to the appointed yard there to remain hour after hour in the hope that the wind might blow them some stray ship, so that other gangs might be wanted, and the calling foreman seek them there. It is a curious sight to see the men waiting in these yards to be hired at fourpence per hour, for such are the terms given in the after part of the day. There, seated on long benches ranged against the wall, they remain, some telling their miseries and some their crimes to one another, whilst others doze away their time. Rain or sunshine, there can always be found plenty ready to catch the stray shilling or eight penneth of work. By the size of the shed you can tell how many men sometimes remain there in the pouring rain, rather than run the chance of losing the stray hour's work. Some loiter on the bridges close by, 
and presently, as their practised eye or ear tells them that the calling foreman is in want of another gang, they rush forward in a stream towards the gate, though only six or eight at most can be hired out of the hundred or more that are waiting there. Again the same mad fight takes place as in the morning. There is the same jumping on benches, the same raising of hands, the same entreaties, and the same failures as before. It is strange to mark the change that takes place in the manner of the men when the foreman has left. Those that have been engaged go smiling to their labour. Indeed, I myself met on the quay just such a chattling gang passing to their work. Those who are left behind give vent to their disappointment in abuse of him whom they had been supplicating and smiling at a few minutes before. At four o'clock the eight hours' labour ceases, and then comes the paying. The names of the men are called out of the muster book, and each man, as he answers to the cry, has half a crown given to him. So rapidly is this done that in a quarter of an hour the whole of the men have had their wages paid them. They then pour towards the gate. Here two constables stand, and as each man passes through the wicket he takes his hat off, and is felt from head to foot by the dock officers and attendant. And yet, with all the want, misery, and temptation, the millions of pounds of property amid which they work, and the thousands of pipes and hogsheads of wine and spirits about the docks, I am informed upon the best authority that there are on an average but thirty charges of drunkenness in the course of the year, and only eight of dishonesty every month. This may perhaps arise from the vigilance of the superintendents, but to see the distressed condition of the men who seek and gain employment in the London dock, it appears almost incredible that out of so vast a body of men, without means and without character, there should be so little vice or crime. There still remains one curious circumstance to be added in connection with the destitution of the dock labourers. Close to the gate by which they are obliged to leave sits on a coping stone the refreshment man, with his two large canvas pockets tied in front of him and filled with silver and copper, ready to give change to those whom he has trusted with their dinner that day, until they were paid. Having made myself acquainted with the character and amount of the labour performed, I next proceeded to make inquiries into the condition of the labourers themselves, and thus to learn the average amount of their wages from so precarious an occupation. For this purpose, Hearing that there were several cheap lodging-houses in the neighbourhood, I thought I should be better enabled to arrive at an average result by conversing with the inmates of them, and thus endeavouring to elicit from them some such statement of their earnings at one time and another as would enable me to judge what was their average amount throughout the year. I had heard the most pathetic accounts from men in the waiting-yard, how they had been six weeks without a day's hire. I had been told of others who had been known to come there day after day in the hope of getting sixpence, and who lived upon the stray pieces of bread given to them in charity by their fellow labourers. Of one person I was informed by a gentleman who had sought out his history in pure sympathy from the wretchedness of the man's appearance. The man had once been possessed of five hundred pounds a year, and had squandered it all away, and through some act or acts that I do not feel myself at liberty to state, had lost caste, character, friends, and everything that could make life easy for him. From that time he had sunk and sunk in the world, until at last he had found him, with a lodging-house for his dwelling-place, the associate of thieves and pickpockets. His only means of living at this time was bones and rag-grubbing, and for this purpose the man would wander through the streets at three every morning, to see what little bits of old iron or rag or refuse bone he could find in the roads. His principal source of income, I am informed, from such a source as precludes the possibility of doubt, was by picking up the refuse ends of cigars, drying them and selling them at one halfpenny per ounce as tobacco to the thieves with whom he lodged. The scenes witnessed at the London dock were of so painful a description, the struggle for one day's work the scramble for twenty-four hours extra subsistence and extra life, were of so tragic a character that I was anxious to ascertain, if possible, the exact number of individuals in and around the metropolis who live by dock labour. I have said that at one of the docks alone I found that eighteen hundred and twenty-three stomachs would be deprived of food by the mere chopping of the breeze. 
It's an ill wind, says the proverb, that blows nobody good. And until I came to investigate the condition of the dock labourer, I could not have believed it possible that near upon two thousand souls in one place alone lived chameleon-like upon the air, or that an easterly wind, despite the wise saw, could deprive so many of bread. It is indeed a nipping and an eager air. That the sustenance of thousands of families should be as fickle as the very breeze itself, that the weathercock should be the index of daily want or daily ease to such a vast number of men, women, and children, was a climax of misery and wretchedness that I could not have imagined to exist. And since that I have witnessed such scenes of squalor and crime and suffering as oppress the mind even to a feeling of awe. The docks of London are to a superficial observer the very focus of metropolitan wealth. The cranes creak with the mass of riches. In the warehouses are stored goods that are, as it were, ingots of untold gold. Above and below ground you see piles upon piles of treasure that the eye cannot compass. The wealth appears as boundless as the very sea it has traversed. The brain aches in an attempt to comprehend the amount of riches before, above and beneath it. There are acres upon acres of treasure, more than enough, one would fancy, to stay the cravings of the whole world. And yet you have but to visit the hovels grouped round about all this amazing excess of riches to witness the same amazing excess of poverty. If the incomprehensibility of the wealth rises to sublimity, assuredly the want that coexists with it is equally incomprehensible and equally sublime. Pass from the quay and warehouses to the courts and alleys that surround them, and the mind is as bewildered with the destitution of the one place as it is with the superabundance of the other. Many come to see the riches, but few the poverty, abounding in absolute masses round the far-famed port of London. End of London Dock Recording by Patrick Wallace Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo The Revelation by Robert W. Service The same old sprint in the morning, boys, to the same old din and smut, chained all day to the same old desk, down in the same old rut, posting the same old greasy books, catching the same old train. Oh, how will I manage to stick it all if I ever get back again? We've bidden goodbye to a life in a cage. We're finished with pushing a pen. They're pumping us full of bellicose rage. They're showing us how to be men. We're only beginning to find ourselves. We're wonders of brawn in thew. But when we go back to our sissy jobs, oh, what are we going to do? For shoulders curved with a counter stoop will be carried erect and square, and faces white from the office light will be bronzed by the open air, and we'll walk with a stride of a newborn pride with a new found joy in our eyes, scornful men who have diced with death under the naked skies. And when we get back to the dreary grind and the bald-headed boss's call, don't you think that the dingy window blind and the dingier office wall will suddenly melt to a vision of space of violent, flame-scarred night? Then, oh, the joy of the danger thrill, and oh, the roar of the fight. Don't you think as we pedal a cart of pins the counter will fade away? And again we'll be seeing the sandbag rims and the barbed wire's misty gray. As a flat voice asks for a pound of tea, don't you fancy we'll hear instead the night wind moan in the soothing drone of the packet that's overhead? Don't you guess that the things we're seeing now will haunt us through all the years, 
heaven and hell rolled into one glory and blood and tears life's pattern picked with a scarlet thread where once we wove with a gray to remind us all how we played our part in the shock of an epic day oh we're booked for the great adventure now we're pledged to the real romance we'll find ourselves or we'll lose ourselves somewhere in giddy old france we'll know the zest of the fighter's life the best that we have will give we'll hunger and thirst we'll die but first we'll live by the gods we'll live we'll breathe free air and we'll bivouac under the starry sky we'll march with men and we'll fight with men and we'll see men laugh and die we'll know such joys we never dreamed we'll fathom the deeps of pain but the hardest bit of it all will be when we come back home again for some of us smirk in a chiffon shop and some of us teach in a school some of us help with the seat of our pants to polish an office stool the merits of somebody's soap or jam some of us seek to explain but all of us wonder what we'll do when we have to go back again end of the revelation coffee break collection 15 the world of work this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Excerpt from The Right to Work by John Elliot Ross, 1884 to 1946. Published in 1917. Recently there appeared in one of our big dailies a cartoon poignantly depicting the beginning and the end of unemployment two ragged men sat on a bench in a public square one slouches down upon the seat his ears drawn into his collar his hands in his pockets a perfect portrayal of the man who has given up the fight the other has not sunk so far he is leaning forward his face in his hands his attitude not yet one of unresentful impotence his companion says cheer up bo think of the men in the trenches and the reply eloquently voices the suffering of the self-respecting unemployed huh they've got a chance to be shot there is some hope for the man who would rather die than endure his existence unworthy of a man he still has some fight in him if a lifeline can be thrown him he will be saved but the man who ceased to desire to work is hopeless all internal resistance has been broken down no vestige of self-respect or backbone is left if he is to be saved it must be from outside and by being built up anew but there are still blacker shadows to this picture if it were merely a question of two million men more or less responsible for their own fate sinking into this demoralized condition it would be serious enough they might reasonably expect christians with a command laid upon them to love their neighbor as themselves to do something to help them but unfortunately these men are not simply dropping back themselves they are pulling others with them millions of dependent women and children are being dragged into the slough of despond because the heads of families are no longer able to cope with the problem of support wives are forced out into casual employment home duties neglected children run wild or have their lives ground out in soul and body destroying toil we have heard much recently of the horrible evils of child and woman labor thousands of children are stunted in mind and body because they must take their place in industry before their time children have actually been killed by excessive work in factories and others who do not go to work have hardly a better fate in every school in the poorer districts of our cities you can see the pinched and sallow faces the spindle legs bespeaking slow starvation 
women too at the most critical periods when other lives are depending so directly upon theirs are compelled to such heavy labor as saps not only their own vitality but the strength of the coming generation how can they possibly nourish two on what is not sufficient for one how can children born into such conditions be anything but weak and sickly and fretful directly or indirectly unemployment is responsible for all these ills for even when the head of the family has work it is the fear of unemployment that makes him accept less than a living wage and then drives his wife and children to eke out his pittance with their own this is the sword of democles that is constantly over the helpless working man's head he does not know at what moment it may fall to maim for ever not only himself but also his loved ones but this does not exhaust the evils of unemployment like some great octopus it is reaching out its fearful tentacles to draw millions upon millions into its greedy maw it is not content with its immediate victims and their dependents but it poisons the life of the whole community obviously the good samaritan is affected for whence come the food and clothing and shelter that the idle need these men must be supported in some way if there were two million men idle last winter then for every day of idleness at least two million dollars in wages are lost and while naturally this huge army does not spend as much in times of idleness as it did when employed nevertheless it must need tremendous sums for its support some of this money comes from past savings but much must also come from those who are still employed the longer idleness continues the more of a burden does this army of unemployed become yet another loss to the community is derived from the fact that if these men had continued working they would have added to the wealth of the nation about two and one-half times their wages that is to say if their wages would have been a billion dollars the total product of their labor would have been worth before deducting their pay three and one-half billions such a loss of national wealth would be serious under any conditions but it is doubly serious when we are paying a fuel bill as it were to burn it up if a fire or earthquake or flood were to destroy this much wealth every paper in the country would deplore it why then do we calmly ignore this much worse condition which yearly engulfs not alone material wealth but the very life's blood of the nation in ruined manhood and womanhood and childhood again the business men who have to bear the burden of charity to support these unemployed must do so from decreased resources because of the lessened purchasing power of the public no man can prosper in business unless his neighbor prospers too the merchant is engaged in selling and the greater his neighbor's power to pay the more he can sell the corner groceryman realizes this well he knows that if his patrons are out of work his bills will be unpaid and others are affected similarly though not so visibly inability to sell reacts too upon the wages of employees as well as upon the profits of employers so that the effects of unemployment reaches all classes the working men employed the merchant the good samaritan the priest and the levite still further the fact that two million persons are consuming without producing means that the cost of living will rise for prices will be higher than they would be were the supply increased by the possible product of all these idle workers there is then no way in which anyone can pass by on the other side of these unfortunates whether or not their hearts are touched with christian charity the blight of their brother's misfortune will shadow their fortune only the very few such as loan sharks who make a business of preying upon the poor can profit by large masses being out of work all legitimate business suffers directly or indirectly 
it has frequently been said that each workman in europe is carrying a soldier on his back but it is a vigorous soldier who can be of some use to his country with us the workers are carrying an army on their backs but it is a helpless a useless a vicious consuming and non-producing army that can do the country no good under any conditions it is almost as if each laborer were carrying a foreign invading soldier on their back we have often heard it said during the present war that europe has reverted to barbarism other people are aghast at the destruction of life and property going on abroad they thank god that they are not as other men that they have more christian charity more love for their brothers than to indulge in such senseless slaughter yet it might be better for us to stand afar off in the temple and strike our breasts while asking god to be merciful to us sinners for the comparison is not entirely to our credit the soldier dies with an ideal in his heart with love for his country and his hearth with his manhood intact our poor ragged soldier does not perhaps lose his life he loses only his self-respect his manhood his faith in his fellow man his faith in god in this army of ours there is none of the morale that comes from discipline none of the spiritual exaltation that is induced by consecration to a cause none of the confidence and efficiency inspired by trusted leaders our soldier has strength but is forbidden to use it has protectiveness that is turned to bitter raging impotence he has skill which is lost in the gradual relaxation of physical and moral fibre his vision becomes shifty his muscles relaxed his will feeble and if he does not escape in time it will take a miracle to save him almost literally he will have to be born again if he is to be redeemed end of excerpt from right to work coffee break collection fifteen the world of work this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Robinson Development of the Phonograph at Alexander Graham Bell's Volta Laboratory by Leslie J. Newville The fame of Thomas A. Edison rests most securely on his genius for making practical application of the ideas of others. However, it was Alexander Graham Bell long a smithsonian regent and friend of its third secretary s p langley who with his volta laboratory associates made practical the phonograph which has been called edison's most original invention the author leslie j newville wrote this paper while he was attached to the office of the curator of science and technology in the smithsonian institution's united states national museum the story of alexander graham bell's invention of the telephone has been told and retold how he became involved in the difficult task of making practical phonograph records, and succeeded, in association with Charles Sumner Tainter and Chichester Bell, is not so well known. But material collected through the years by the U.S. National Museum of the Smithsonian Institution now makes clear how Bell and two associates took Edison's tinfoil machine and made it reproduce sound from wax instead of tinfoil. They began their work in Washington, D.C. in 1879, and continued until granted basic patents in 1886 for recording in wax. Preserved at the Smithsonian are some 20 pieces of experimental apparatus, including a number of complete machines. Their first experimental machine was sealed in a box and deposited in the Smithsonian Archives in 1881. The others were delivered by Alexander Graham Bell to the National Museum in two lots in 1915 and 1922. Bell was an old man by this time, busy with his aeronautical experiments in Nova Scotia. It was not until 1947, however, that the museum received the key to the experimental gramophones, as they were called, to differentiate them from the Edison machine. In that year, Mrs. Laura F. Tainter donated to the museum ten bound notebooks, along with Tainter's unpublished autobiography. 
This material describes in detail the strange machines and even stranger experiments, which led in 1886 to a greatly improved phonograph. Thomas A. Edison had invented the phonograph in 1877, but the fame bestowed on Edison for this startling invention, sometimes called his most original, was not due to its efficiency. Recording with the tinfoil phonograph is too difficult to be practical. The tinfoil tears easily, and even when the stylus is properly adjusted, the reproduction is distorted and squeaky, and good for only a few playbacks. Nevertheless, young Edison, the wizard as he was called, had hit upon a secret of which men had dreamed for centuries. Immediately after this discovery, however, he did not improve it, allegedly because of an agreement to spend the next five years developing the New York City electric light and power system. Meanwhile, Bell, always a scientist and experimenter at heart, after his invention of the telephone in 1876, was looking for new worlds to conquer. If we accept Tainter's version of the story, it was through Gardner Green Hubbard that Bell took up the phonograph challenge. Bell had married Hubbard's daughter, Mabel, in 1879. Hubbard was then president of the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company, and his organization, which had purchased the Edison patent, was having trouble with its finances because people did not like to buy a machine which seldom worked well and proved difficult for an unskilled person to operate. In 1879, Hubbard got Bell interested in improving the machine, and it was agreed that a laboratory should be set up in Washington. Experiments were also to be conducted in the transmission of sound by light, and this resulted in the selenium cell photophone, patented in 1881. Both the Hubbards and the Bells decided to move to the capital. While Bell took his bride to Europe for an extended honeymoon, his associate, Charles Sumner Tainter, a young instrument maker, was sent on to Washington from Cambridge, Massachusetts to start the laboratory. Bell's cousin, Chichester Bell, who had been teaching college chemistry in London, agreed to come as the third associate. During his stay in Europe, Bell received a 50,000 franc, $10,000, Volta Prize, and it was with this money that the Washington Project, the Volta Laboratory Association, was financed. A description of the procedure used is found on page 67 of Tainter's unpublished autobiography. There, Tainter quotes Chichester Bell as follows. Quote, a gel of bichromate of potash solution, vibrated by the voice, was directed against a glass plate immediately in front of a slit, on which light was concentrated by means of a lens. The jet was so arranged that the light on its way to the slit had to pass through the nap, and as the thickness of this was constantly changing, the illumination of the slit was also varied. By means of a lens, an image of this slit was thrown upon the rotating gelatin bromide plate, on which, accordingly, a record of the voice vibrations was obtained." Unquote. Tainter's story in his autobiography of the establishment of the laboratory shows its comparative simplicity. I therefore wound up my business affairs in Cambridge, packed up all of my tools and machines, and went to Washington, and after much search, rented a vacant house on L Street between 13th and 14th Streets, and fitted it up for our purposes. The Smithsonian Institution sent us over a mail sack of scientific books from the library of the institution to consult and, primed with all we could learn, we went to work. We were like the explorers in an entirely unknown land, where one has to select the path that seems to be the most likely to get you to your destination, with no knowledge of what is ahead. In conducting our work, we had first to design an experimental apparatus, then hunt about, often in Philadelphia and New York, for the materials with which to construct it which were usually hard to find, and finally build the models we needed ourselves. The experimental machines built at the Volta Laboratory included both disc and cylinder types, and an interesting tape recorder. The records used with the machines and now in the collections of the U.S. National Museum are believed to be the oldest reproducible records preserved anywhere in the world. While some are scratched and cracked, others are still in good condition. By 1881, the Volta Associates had succeeded in improving an Edison tinfoil machine to some extent. Wax was put in the grooves of the heavy iron cylinder, and no tinfoil was used. Rather than apply for a patent at that time, however, they deposited the machine in a sealed box at the Smithsonian and specified that it was not to be opened without the consent of two of the three men. In 1937, Tainter was the only one still living, so the box was opened with his permission. For the occasion, the heirs of Alexander Graham Bell gathered in Washington, but Tainter was too old and too ill to come from San Diego. 
The sound vibrations had been indented in the wax which had been applied to the Edison phonograph. The following is the text of the recording. Quote, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed of in your philosophy. I am a gramophone, and my mother was a phonograph. Unquote. Remarked Mrs. Gilbert Grosvenor, Bell's daughter, when the box was opened in 1837, quote, That is just the sort of thing father would have said. He was always quoting from the classics. Unquote. The method of reproduction used on the machine, however, is even more interesting than the quotation. Rather than a stylus and diaphragm, a jet of air under high pressure was used. Quote, this evening, about 7 p.m., Tainter noted on July 7, 1881, the apparatus being ready, the valve upon the top of the air cylinder was opened slightly until a pressure of about 100 pounds was indicated by the gauge. The phonograph cylinder was then rotated, and the sounds produced by the escaping air could be heard, and the words understood a distance of at least 8 feet from the phonograph. Unquote. The point of the jet is glass, and could be directed at a single groove. The other experimental gramophones indicate an amazing range of experimentation. While the method of cutting a record on wax was the one later exploited commercially, everything else seems to have been tried at least once. The following was noted on Wednesday, March 20, 1881. Quote, a fountain pen is attached to a diaphragm so as to be vibrated in a plane parallel to the axis of a cylinder. The ink used in this pen to contain iron in a finely divided state and the pen caused to trace a spiral line around the cylinder as it turned. The cylinder to be covered with a sheet of paper upon which the record is made. This ink can be rendered magnetic by means of a permanent magnet. The sounds were to be reproduced by simply substituting a magnet for the fountain pen. Unquote. The result of these ideas for magnetic reproduction resulted in patent 341287, granted on May 4, 1886. It deals solely with the, quote, reproduction through the action of magnetism of sounds by means of records in solid substances, unquote. The air jet used in reproducing has already been described. Other jets of molten metal, wax, and water were also tried. On Saturday, May 19, 1883, Tainter wrote, Made the following experiment today. The cylinder of the Edison photograph was covered with a coating of paraffin wax and then turned off true and smooth. A cutting style, A, secured by the end of a lever, B, was then adjusted over the cylinder as shown. Lever B was pivoted at the points C, D, and the only pressure exerted to force the style into the wax was due to the weight of the parts. Upon the top of A was fixed a small brass disc, and immediately over it a sensitive water jet adjusted, so that the stream of water at its sensitive part fell upon the center of the brass disc. The phonograph cylinder, E, was rotated while words and sounds were shouted to the support to which the water jet was attached and a record that was quite visible to the unaided eye was the result. The tape recorder, an unusual instrument which recorded mechanically on a 3 16th inch strip of wax-covered paper, is one of the machines described and illustrated in U.S. Patent 341214, dated May 4, 1886. The strip was coated by dipping it in a solution of beeswax and paraffin, one part white beeswax, two parts paraffin by weight, then scraping one side clean and allowing the other side to harden. The machine of sturdy wood and metal construction is hand-powered by means of a knob fastened to the flywheel. From the flywheel, shaft power is transferred by a small friction wheel to a vertical shaft. At the bottom of the shaft, a V-pulley transfers motion by belts to corresponding V-pulleys beneath the horizontal reels. The wax strip passes from one 8-inch reel around the periphery of a pulley with guided flanges, mounted above the V-pulleys on the main vertical shaft, where it comes in contact with the recording or reproducing stylus. It is then taken up on the other reel. The sharp recording stylus, actuated by a vibrating mica diaphragm, cuts the wax from the strip. In reproducing, a dull, loosely mounted stylus attached to a rubber diaphragm carried sounds through an ear tube to the listener. Both recording and reproducing heads, mounted alternately on the same two posts, could be adjusted vertically so that several records could be cut on the same 3 16 inch strip. While this machine was never developed commercially, it is an interesting ancestor of the modern tape recorder, which it resembles somewhat in design. How practical it was, or just why it was built, we do not know. The tape is now brittle, the heavy paper reels warped, and the reproducing head missing. Otherwise, with some reconditioning, it could be put into working condition. Most of the disc machines designed by the Volta Associates had the disc mounted vertically. The explanation is that in the early experiments, the turntable with disc was mounted on the shop lathe, along with the recording and reproducing heads. Later, when the complete models were built, most of them featured vertical turntables.
An interesting exception has a horizontal 7-inch turntable. This machine, although made in 1886, is a duplicate of one made earlier but taken to Europe by Chichester Bell. Tainter was granted U.S. patent 385886 for it on July 10, 1888. The playing arm is rigid except for a pivoted vertical motion of 90 degrees to allow removal of the record or return to the starting position. While recording or playing, the record not only rotated, but moved laterally under the stylus, which thus described a spiral, recording 150 grooves to the inch. The Bell and Tainter records preserved at the Smithsonian are both of the lateral cut and Hill and Dale types. Edison, for many years, used the Hill and Dale method with both cylinder and disc records, and Emil Berliner is credited with the invention of the lateral cut gramophone record in 1887. The Volta Associates, however, had been experimenting with both types as early as 1881, as is shown by the following quotation from Tainter. The record on the electrotype in the Smithsonian package is of the other form, where the vibrations are impressed parallel to the surface of the recording material, as was done in the Old Scott phonograph of 1857, thus forming a groove of uniform depth but of wavy character, in which the sides of the groove act upon the tracing point instead of the bottom, as is the case of the vertical type. This form we named the zigzag form, and referred to it in that way in our notes. Its important advantage in guiding the reproducing needle I first called attention to in the note on page 9, volume 1, Home Notes on March 29, 1881, and endeavored to use it in my early work, but encountered so much difficulty in getting a form of reproducer that would work with the soft wax records without tearing the groove, we used the hill and valley type of record more often than the other. In 1885, when the Volta Associates were sure that they had a number of practical inventions, they filed applications for patents. They also began to look around for investors. After giving several demonstrations in Washington, they gained the necessary support, and the American Gramophone Company was organized to manufacture and sell the machines. The Volta Gramophone Company was formed to control the patents. The Howe Sewing Machine Factory at Bridgeport, Connecticut became the American Gramophone Plant. Tainter went there to supervise the manufacturing, and continued his inventive work for many years. This Bridgeport plant is still in use today by a successor firm, the Dictaphone Corporation. The work of the Volta Associates laid the foundation for the successful use of the dictating machine in business, for their wax recording process was practical and their machines sturdy. But it was to take several more years and the renewed work of Edison and further developments by Berliner and many others before the talking machine industry really got underway and became a major factor in home entertainment. End of Development of the Phonograph at Alexander Graham Bell's Volta Laboratory Recording by Robert Robinson Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Roundup From Boy Ranchers on the Trail By Willard F. Baker. Come on, Nort, it's your turn to cut out the next one. I suppose I'd make a mux of it, bud. Shucks, you won't do that. You've roped a calf before. Yes, but not at a big round-up like this. If I make a fizzle, the fellows will give me the laugh. What if they do? Everybody knows you haven't been at it long, and you've got to make a start. Besides, anybody's likely to make a mistake. That's why they put rubbers on the end of pencils. Ride in now and snake out the next one, Nort. All right, bud, here goes. Blaze, the pony Nort Shannon, was riding toward the bunch of cattle gathered at Diamond X Ranch for the big spring roundup, leaped forward at the sound of his master's voice, and in response to the little jerk of the reins and the clap of heels against his sides. Into the herd of milling, turning, and twisting cattle, the intelligent animal made his way, needing hardly any guidance from naught. The lad, by a mere touch, corrected the course of Blaze slightly, and in a moment he was heading for a calf which bawled loudly. "'Get him, naught!' cried a voice from among the cowboys looking on. "'Don't get me fussed, Dick!' Nort shouted back to his brother, who sat astride his pony near Bud Merkel. "'It'll be your turn next!' Into the herd he wormed his way on Blaze, dodging here and there, but with his eyes ever on the calf he'd hoped to cut out, so it could be branded. Nort leaned forward in his saddle, 
and then his cousin and brother, eagerly watching from outside the herd, saw the boy rancher's hand shoot up. Through the air the rope went, turning, twisting, writhing and uncoiling like a snake. In an instant it had flipped around the hind legs of a calf. Good! yelled Dick. Even Babe couldn't have done better, complimented Bud enthusiastically. "'Tis an over yet, gasped Nort, for he had hard work ahead of him, and the dust raised by thousands of hoofs was choking. Wait till I get it to the branding corral. He leaned over in his other stirrup, causing the lariat to pull taut, and, the next instant, the calf flopped on its side. Snake him out, Blaze, cried Nort to his pony, and the animal turned and dragged the prostrate calf along over the ground, an operation not as cruel as it sounds as the surface was inches thick in soft dust like flour. "'That's the boy, Nort," called his cousin Bud. "'I knew you could do it. Now then, Dick, let's see how you'll make out.' "'I can't throw a rope as good as Nort," answered the stouter lad as he urged his pony, Blackie, into the herd. "'But here goes.' Meanwhile, Nort had dragged the calf he had cut out to the corral, where the branding was going on. Two cowboys, stationed there for the purpose, leaped forward and threw the calf over on its side, for it had managed to struggle to its feet when Nort ceased dragging it. One man twisted a front leg of the struggling creature back in a hammerlock and knelt on its neck. The other took hold of the upper hind leg, and with this hold prevented the calf from sprawling along on the ground. "'Sit on him!' called Mr. Merkel, owner of Diamond X and other ranches. He was superintending the round-up of his herds, and those entrusted to Bud, Nort, and Dick, in the first business venture of the boy ranchers. "'Sit on him!' yelled Bud's father. Accordingly, the men sat on the calf thus, with the holds they had secured, keeping it under restraint, with the least possible pain to the small creature. "'Branding iron!' sang out Slim Degnan, foreman of the ranch. A little blaze was flickering on the ground, not far from where the calf Nort had cut out was thrown and held. In a moment the fire-tender had seized the branding iron, and, a second or two later, it was being pressed on the calf's flank. The creature bawled loudly and kicked out, thereby nearly throwing off the men who were sitting on it, but the branding was all over in a moment, and the men leaped up, releasing the animal. The calf stood dazed for the time being, after it had scrambled to its feet, and then trotted out of the corral, lashing its side with its little tail. Plainly branded on it now, never to be completely effaced, was the mark of the ownership of Mr. Merkel, an X inside a diamond. Next, called the branders, here comes Dick, shouted Bud, as Nort rode up beside him, and he got his calf. Good, exclaimed the brother. I guess we're learning the business. Surest thing you know, asserted the son of the owner of Diamond X. I told you it wasn't so hard, and you've done the same thing before. But not such a big round-up, remarked Nort, as he prepared to ride in again and cut out another calf. Yes, it is big, admitted Bud, as he made ready for his share in the affair, his task being the same as that of his cousin's, to cut out the calves for branding purposes. It sure is a big round-up. It had been in progress for days. Twice a year on the big western ranches, the cattle are driven in from the outlying ranges to be tallied, inspected, marked, and shipped away. The spring and fall round-ups are always busy seasons at any ranch. During the times between round-ups, the new calves attained their growth, but they needed to have branded into their hides the marks of their owners. Then, too, some yearlings escaped branding at times, either by remaining out of sight at the round-up, or in the attending confusion. Unbranded calves, who had partly attained their growth, were termed mavericks, and when the herds of different owners mingled, there was, usually, a division of the mavericks, since it could not be accurately told who owned them. The title Maverick was derived from a stockman of that name, whose practice was to claim all unbranded calves in the herd. His cowboys would ride about, cutting out the unmarked animals, with the cool statement, That's a maverick, meaning that it belonged to their boss.
and so the name has commonly become associated with any half-grown, unbranded calf. Mr. Merkel was the owner of several ranches, Square M, Triangle B, and Diamond X, not to mention Diamond X Second or Flume Valley, of which his son Bud and the latter's cousins, Norton and Richard Shannon, were the nominal proprietors. The cattle from Flume Valley, or Happy Valley, as Bud called it, after the mystery of the underground water was solved, were in the round-up with the others from his father's ranches. For days preceding the lively doings I have just described, the cowboys, called in from distant ranges, had driven the cattle toward the central assembling point, the corrals at Diamond X. Slowly the longhorns, the shorthorns, and the cattle, with no horns at all, had been hazed in from their feeding grounds toward Diamond X. The cowpunchers had galloped hard all day, and they had ridden herd at night to keep the animals from straying. At night this was not so hard, for the animals were glad to rest during the darkness. But during the day there was always some steer, often more than one, that wanted to run away from the herd. As this might start a stampede, it was necessary to drive the striker back, and this was, often enough, a difficult task. Bud, Nort, and Dick had borne their share of this difficult round-up task, and now, when the thousand or more of steers, calves, and mavericks had been gathered at Diamond X, the work of tallying them, branding those that were without marks, and shipping away the best was well under way. In and out of the herd rode the boy ranchers, doing their best alongside of more seasoned punchers. Calves were cut out, thrown and branded, to be quickly released and again mingle with the herd. "'Oh, I'm Captain Jinx of the Horse Marines,' one of the cowboys, wiping the dust and sweat from his face with his big red silk handkerchief, or rather neckerchief, started this song. It was taken up by half a score of loud voices. Yippee! came in centaurian tones from yelling kid this is the life but as just then his pony slipped and he missed the throw he made for a calf it is doubtful if yelling kid felt as gay as he sounded what work eh boys asked mr merkel when dick nort and bud rode past to get drinks of water but it's great all the same answered dick with shining eyes eyes that gleamed amid a face dark with the tan of the western sun and grimy with the dust of the western plains. "'Glad you like it,' commented the proprietor of Diamond X as he kept on with his tallying. "'How they come in, Slim?' he asked his foreman. "'Couldn't be better. Old Bucktooth is doing a heap sight more than I ever dreamed a Zuni could.' "'Bud said that his old Indian helper was up to snuff,' commented Mr. Merkel. "'I'm glad to know it. Heard anything from Double Z?' he asked, and there was an anxious note in his voice. "'No, Hank and his gang seem to have quieted down after what I told him. "'Well, I hope he doesn't make trouble for Bud and the boys. "'They're going back to Happy Valley tonight.' "'So I understand. "'Oh, shucks, don't worry about Hank. He's all talk. "'He and that blustery foreman of his, Ike Johnson.' There had been a dispute between the cowboys of Diamond X and those of Double Z, a ranch owned by the notorious Hank Fisher, a few days before the round-up, the subject of dispute being the ownership of certain mavericks. It had ended with the triumph of Slim Degnan, foreman of Mr. Merkel's holdings. And so the round-up went on, the heat, the dust, the noise and confusion increasing as calf after calf, maverick after maverick was branded, and the steers to be shipped were cut out, to be hazed over to the railroad stockyards. And yet, with all the seeming confusion, there was order and system in the work. "'Well, I guess this is the last,' remarked Mr. Merkel to his son, as Bud and his cousins rode slowly up to the ranch house, when the final calf had been cut out and the tally made. "'You boys going back after grub?' "'Yep,' answered Bud, but there was no enthusiasm in his voice. He, like his cousins, was too tired, for the day had been a gruelling one, with the heat and hard work. "'You sure did make out a whole lot better than I ever thought you would,' said Mr. Merkel, as he rode along with his son and nephews. "'Putting water into that valley made a big difference.' "'I should say so,' exclaimed Bud. 
Our stock will lay over anything you will ship from any of your three ranches, Dad. I wouldn't wonder but what you were right, Bud. Well, let's wash up and eat. One by one the cowboys drifted in, some singing ranch songs in spite of their weariness. Bud and his cousins were through with their meal first, and having persuaded his sister Nell to pack a basket of doughnuts, pie and cheese for him, Bud signalled to his cousins to join him out at the pony corral. "'Let's get an early start back to Happy Valley,' he urged. "'It's a long enough ride, anyhow.' "'You said it,' commented Nort. "'Well, there's one thing we don't have to worry about, "'and that is not finding any water running into the reservoir,' added Dick, "'as he slipped in through the gate and caught one of his ponies. "'Not Blackie, who was tired out from the round-up. "'Each cow-puncher, including the boy ranchers, "'had several animals in his string. "'No, I guess we solved the mystery of the water supply.' "'We'll have no more trouble,' agreed Bud. "'The boy ranchers rode over the trail to their own camp. "'It was actually a camp, "'for permanent ranch buildings had not yet been erected in Happy Valley, "'though some were projected. "'Tents formed the abiding place of our heroes, "'and as they were only there during the summer months, "'the canvas shelters served very well indeed. "'The moon rose, shining down from a starlit sky.' as the rough but faithful and sturdy cow-ponies ambled along. Now the boy ranchers would be down in some swale or valley, and again topping one of the foothills which led to Buffalo Ridge or Snake Mountain, between which elevations lay Happy Valley, where the cattle of Diamond X Second were quartered. "'There she is, the old camp,' murmured Dick, as they started down the slope which led to the collection of tents erected against the earthen and stone bank of the reservoir and maybe i won't hit the hay exclaimed bud with a yawn we don't have to get up to-morrow until we're ready oh boy cried nought in delight they rode forward and were almost at their camp when bud who had trotted ahead pulled his pony to a sudden stop and cried out hold on there who are you and where are you going at the same moment his cousin saw the moon gleaming on the forty-five gun which Bud drew from his holster. End of The Roundup Chapter 1 of The Boy Ranchers on the Trail Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Song of Industrial America by Sherwood Anderson They tell themselves so many little lies, my beloved. Now wait, little hand. You can't sing. We are standing in a crowd by a bridge in the west. Hear the voices. Turn around. Let's go home. I am tired. They tell themselves so many little lies. You remember, in the night, we arose. We were young. There was smoke in the passage, and you laughed. Was it good, that black smoke? Look away to the streams and the lake. We're alive. See my hand, how it trembles on the rail. Here is song, here in America. Here now, in our time. Now wait, I'll go to the train. I'll not swing off into tunes. I'm all right. I just want to talk. You watch my hand on the rail of this bridge. I press down. The blood goes down. There. That steadies me. It makes me all right. Now here is how it's going to come. The song, I mean. I've watched things, men and faces. I know. First there are the broken things, myself and the others. I don't mind that. I'm gone, shot to pieces. I'm a part of the scheme. I'm the broken end of a song myself. We are all that here in the West, here in Chicago. Tongues clatter against teeth. There is nothing but shrill screams and a rattle. That had to be. It's part of the scheme. Souls, dry souls, rattle around. Winter of song. Winter of song. Now, faint little voice, do lift up. They are swept away in the void. That's true enough. It had to be so from the very first. Pshaw! 
I'm steady enough. Let me alone. Keokuk, Tennessee, Michigan, Chicago, Kalamazoo. Don't the names in this country make you fairly drunk? We'll stand by this brown stream for hours. I'll not be swept away. Watch my hand, how steady it is. To catch this song and sing it would do much. Make much clear. Come close to me, warm little thing. It is night. I am cold. When I was a boy in my village here in the West, I always knew all the old men. How sweet they were. Quite biblical, too. Makers of wagons and harness and plows. Sailors and soldiers and pioneers. We got Walt and Abraham out of that lot. Then a change came. Drifting along, drifting along. Winter of song, winter of song. You know my city, Chicago triumphant. Factories and marts and the roar of machines, horrible, terrible, ugly, and brutal. It crushed things down and down. Nobody wanted to hurt. They didn't want to hurt me or you. They were caught themselves. I know the old men here, millionaires. I've always known old men all my life. I'm old myself. You would never guess how old I am. Can a singer arise and sing in this smoke and grime? Can he keep his throat clear? Can his courage survive? I'll tell you what it is. Now you be still. To hell with you. I'm an old empty barrel floating in the stream. That's what I am. You stand away. I've come to life. My arms lift up. I begin to swim. Hell and damnation, turn me loose. The floods come on. That isn't the roar of the trains at all. It's the flood. The terrible, horrible flood turned loose. Winter of song. Winter of song. Carried along. Carried along. Now, in the midst of the broken waters of my civilization, rhythm begins. Clear above the flood, I raise my ringing voice. In the disorder and darkness of the night, in the wind and the washing waves, I shout to my brothers lost in the flood. Little faint beginnings of things, old things dead, sweet old things. A life lived in Chicago, in the West, in the whirl of industrial America. God knows you might have become something else, just like me. You might have made soft little tunes, written cynical little ditties, eh? Why the devil didn't you make some money and own an automobile? Do you believe? Now listen, I do. Say, you, now listen. Do you believe the hand of God reached down to me in the flood? I do. Twas like a streak of fire along my back. That's a lie. Of course. The face of God looked down at me over the rim of the world. Don't you see we are all a part of something here in the West? We are trying to break through. I'm a song myself. The broken end of a song myself. We have to sing, you see, here in the darkness. All men have to sing, poor broken things. We have to sing here in the darkness in the roaring flood. We have to find each other. Have you courage tonight for a song? Lift your voices. Come. End of Song of Industrial America Recording by Philip Gould Coffee Break Collection 15, The World of Work This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Street Musicians by Gilbert Gurdon Music hath charms to soothe, we admit, but not all music, and not at all times. And it is this modification of the soothing effects of music that our street minstrels, both vocal and instrumental, seem to be unable or unwilling to comprehend. Yet the street minstrelsy of today is nothing like so outrageously annoying and worrying as it was twenty years ago. Occasionally only do we hear one of the wretched old barrel organs which helped to drive Parliament to pass the Act of 1863. That enactment was intended to minimize or at least to modify the annoyance caused by the so-called music of the streets, and it has succeeded. Speaking generally, there are two kinds of street musicians, the tolerable and the intolerable. 
Amongst the former we may include the poor fiddler who tells us that when he is on the job, he manages to scrape together a decent livelihood. After ten years he has become weather-hardened, and his long-tailed frock coat serves for winter or summer, with the only variation of being buttoned or unbuttoned. He has his regular patrons who look out for him about once a week. One old spinster who lives in a suburban villa is always good for a bob when he plays I dreamt that I dwelt in marble halls. Now and then you may hear the old girl warbling out the ballad with the window wide open, much to the amusement of the passers-by. A few doors off lives an old sea captain whose grandson has always to dance a hornpipe when the fiddler comes round, and the old salt immediately sends out hot rum and water whatever the time of year. When the fiddler tries a new locality he begins with the heart bowed down, which scarcely ever fails to bring a sympathetic someone to the window. His average daily takings are from four to five shillings. In the autumn he plays himself down to Margate and gets a mouthful of fresh air and plenty of recognition. It was an accident that made him take to the tin whistle, or the American flageolet, as he calls it. Bad luck had compelled him to pawn his fiddle. Until he could raise the money to get it out again, he had recourse to the cheapest instrument he could think of, and that was the penny tin whistle. He certainly does get some capital tone out of it, and at a distance it may be mistaken for the piccolo. He did not, however, make much of his playing till he had the whistle soldered on to a tin coffee pot in place of the spout. This took immensely, and the coffee pot brought in more pence than the fiddle, sometimes as much as eight or nine shillings a day. Another penny whistler is a blind man, who morning, noon, and night tootles out the last rose of summer, alternating with a doleful hymn tune. What little money the poor fellow gets is given more out of compassion for his affliction than for any pleasure that his music affords. Conscious, perhaps, that his bagpipes alone would not bring in the bawbees, Sandy McTosh adds the attraction of a Scotch reel or pipe dance. Dressed in full Highland costume, a little bit frowsy, the piper and his boy march along the quiet suburban roads, playing the pipes to attract attention and stopping at a convenient spot to give the dance. He gets very little encouragement, however, except from his own country people. But he has found out their homes, and to them he pays regular visits. There is one real old Mac who invariably celebrates his birthday with a feast of haggis and shepherd's pie, and Sandy McTosh always attends with his pipes to play in the haggis. What is a haggis without the accompaniment of a highland screel? As food and music, the pudding and the pipes match each other admirably, and by the time the feast is finished, and the atoll bros has been tipped off, both Mac and the piper are equally ready to sing, We are na foe. But for the highland families, the lowlanders do not like the pipes, Sandy McTosh and his tribe would starve. There are in London perhaps half a dozen other highland bagpipers and a few frauds, these are the mile enders, dressed up as highlanders, shivering in kilts. For the Killam Callum, two long churchwarden pipes are used instead of the crossed swords. The dancing is just as difficult over the clays as over the claymores, and there is no danger of cutting the toes. Saturday night is the most profitable, then Monday, and Friday is the least. Pipers do not often get molested except by tipsy men who always want to dance. But Sandy then turns on the dreary-sounding drone and plays a doleful tune in extra slow time, so the drunken toper has to do an English instead of a Scotch reel. The Italian tribe of street musicians may be dealt with as a group. There are the bagpipers, the children with the accordion and triangle, the organ man and the monkey, and the hurdy-gurdy grinder, all of whom hail from the neighborhood of Clerkenwell, where there is an Italian colony. At the far end of Leather Lane, in Little Bath Street and Warner Street, they swarm, and there is quite the look and smell and noise of the back slums of an Italian city. The butcher shops are stocked with the heads, trotters, and innards of bullocks, calves, sheep, and pigs. And there is the piggy-wiggy pork shop, and Italian barbers and cobblers. The restaurant Italiano Millard is where many of the Italians spend their lazy day, which is Friday. There are also ice cream makers, roast chestnut merchants and dealers in old clothes. Round the latter the Italian women congregate, and bargain for and try on the gaudy-colored garments, gowns, petticoats, and shawls which must have been specially selected to suit the taste of the Italians. At the corner of Little Bath Street is the headquarters of the organ grinders, 
There they congregate early in the morning before they start on their rounds, and they distribute their monkeys, babies, and dancing children. The premises belong to one of the principal makers of piano organs in London, and the whole of the ground floor is arranged as a depot where some hundreds of instruments are stored. Part of them may be hired, but most of them are owned by the people we see playing them in the streets. A small sum is charged for shed room, and any alterations or repairs can be done on the premises. The proprietors are Italians and are spoken of as very fair-dealing people. We found on inquiry that at least half the owners of the piano organs are English people who have bought their instruments paying ten or fifteen pounds for them by installments. The charge for hire is about ten shillings per week. There is a choice of all the latest popular operatic and music hall tunes, and generally all the tunes are changed every six months, though some tunes, like The Lost Chord and The Village Blacksmith, are seldom taken off of the barrels. A piano organ, if taken care of and protected from the wet, will last ten or twelve years. A new tune, if not very florid, can be put in for nine shillings or ten shillings. The monkey organ man with the old-fashioned discordant barrel organ is an old stager, the original organ grinder. He looks out for the streets where straw is laid down and begins to grind directly. An enraged paterfamilias who has just carefully tied up the knocker with a white kid glove and muffled all the bells calls out to the man, Go away! Do! Don't you see the straw? The organ grinder touches his hat, grins, sends the monkey to climb up the water pipe and begins another tune. Ultimately he gets locked up, then coolly tells the magistrates that he did not go away because he thought the straw was put down so that the noise of the cart should not drown the music. The Savoyard hurdy-gurdy player is almost extinct. The music is produced by the friction of a wheel on one or more strings, and the tone is regulated by pressure on keys. The men admit that they get more money for sitting as artist models than from playing. The hurdy-gurdy is amongst stringed instruments what the bagpipes are amongst the wind instruments but yet no one ever hears them played together. Probably the players themselves could not stand the combined noise. The Italians send out their wives with two babies, not always their own, and when the children get big enough they take the place of the almost obsolete monkey and do the begging. Older Italian girls pick up a lot of money in the city, and their success has prompted several English and Irish girls to imitate them by coloring their skins with walnut juice and rigging themselves out in the Italian style. Many of these girls in earlier life danced around the piano organs in the street and were paid to do so by the organ grinders as people who would give nothing for the music would give a penny to see the little ones dancing. Such a juvenile ball al fresco makes a pretty picture, not thought unworthy of the walls of the Royal Academy. Amongst the intolerable street musicians must certainly be placed the Indian tom-tom player. His instrument is a drum of a very primitive kind made out of a section of the hollow trunk of a tree over each end of which a skin is tightly stretched. It is about the size of an oyster barrel, and the noise is produced by beating it with the hands. There are but two tones, one from each end, and the mournful monotony of the music is only varied by a few notes of a tuneless song which the player now and then puts in. The servant girls are his principal patrons, and some years since one of these tom-tommers completely captivated a young English cookmaid and married her. The bassoonist admits that he has seen better days, but he enjoys playing his awkward-looking instrument, and when in the humor plays it remarkably well. He was once in a military band, and then in an orchestra at a theater, and now picks up a pretty penny by playing in the evening in the West End squares. He don't care for permanent engagements, and prefers to be on his own hook, though he occasionally chums up with another street musician, Old Blowhard, who plays the cornet à piston. He only plays by ear and can therefore only manage a few tunes to which the bassoonist extemporizes a telling bass. According to the bassoonist, Blowhard is a rattling old boy when in a good humor, but he's awful short-tempered, and often when in the middle of a duet, especially in All's Well, he'll stop blowing, call me nasty names, and step it. But he soon comes round again and soaps me over by playing very feelingly, I love new friends, but still give me the dear, dear friends of old. According to Blowhard, Pumper, that is, the bassoonist, is all right when he plays fair, but he will put in flourishes and fireworks which puts me out and spoils everything. Perhaps the oldest and least objectionable of the street musicians is the campanologist, or as he styles himself, the royal bell-ringer. 
he makes a pitch in a quiet street or alley and rigs up his ten bells on a tightened wire. With a short stick in each hand he strikes his bells and produces some pleasing melodies. The general favorites are Home Sweet Home and the Blue Bells of Scotland, and he generally concludes with a wedding peal. Scarcely anyone can object to the performer on the musical glasses. His instrument is simple enough, consisting as it does of glass tumblers sufficient in number to represent about two octaves of notes. They are arranged on a light table in two rows like a harmonicon. The pitch of the notes is regulated by the quantity of water put into each tumbler. One glass is reserved for lemon juice and water into which the performer now and then dips his fingers. The sound is produced by rubbing the wet fingers on the rim of the glasses, and some very pleasing music is the result. According to your nationality you can have Home Sweet Home, Ye Banks and Brays, My Name's Edward Morgan, or The Banks of Allen Water. The one-man band is a well-known character. He began life with a Punch and Judy show, and then played the drum and panpipes. Being of an inventive turn of mind, he added to his instruments the tambourine, triangle, and cymbals which he played by leg movements. Then he added a concertina strapped to the left arm, a pair of clappers occupied his left hand, and with his right hand he played a hurdy-gurdy. The cap and jingling bells on his head completed the band. All these instruments were carefully kept in tune with each other, and the performer produced some passable dance music of the country fair type, while his boy took round the collecting shell. There are several similar performers about the country, but none with so many instruments. The ballad singer seldom starts on his rounds before dusk, and he is careful to get a report whispered widely about that he is the deputy leading tenor of the London Opera Company, and don't want to be seen by daylight as it might injure his reputation. He is above being questioned and tells you bluntly, if you've got anything for the shell, why shell out. If not, shut up. I'll sing you your favorite song, but there's no time for gabbing. He has a powerful and fairly good voice and knows how to use it. He occasionally says he has a cold, and then he puts in an execrable deputy, which further exalts his own powers and himself in the opinion of his admirers. He sings the latest and most popular songs and evidently pockets plenty of money, especially in the autumn at seaside places like Margate and Ramsgate. Our German friends, who have so considerately left their happy fatherland to test the English taste for music, are happily getting less numerous every year, but there are still a few left, some tolerable, some otherwise. They are brought over from the agricultural parts of Germany by an enterprising bandmaster who gives them four shillings a week, pays their fares, provides instruments, uniforms, board and lodging, and teaches them to play some instrument. Their pay increases according to the progress they make. Fulham is their headquarters and Sunday their practice day. The novices begin playing in the northern and eastern suburbs of London, and as they improve they are promoted to the southwest and west. A guide goes with them and he does the collecting. Denmark Hill being a favorite residential locality for well-to-do Germans, the best bands generally work, or rather play, that way. Dogs, especially singing dogs, take great delight in German bands and may often be seen with their noses skyward lifting up their voices in grand chorus, and are no doubt supremely disgusted that their efforts to increase the harmony are not appreciated by the bandsmen. The petticoat quartet comprises four girls supposed to be sisters, but they are none of them communicative, and the answer of the eldest one to our first question was somewhat startling. Ask my pa, said the lady, to the innocent question, are you all sisters? Where they picked up their playing powers, what they earn, and other cognate inquiries were answered by the equivalent of, what's that to you? They appear to have been pestered a good deal with proposals from trousered street musicians to join their band. As the eldest said emphatically, we don't want no professional help from nobody. This reply and an injunction from one of the crowd to let the gals alone checked further inquiries. With regard to the nigger minstrels, there is nothing new to be said, and it has not yet been discovered why the singing of men with blackened hands and faces is liked, when the singing and playing of the same men with uncolored skins would not be tolerated. Niggers, real niggers, never could either sing or play, but our nigger minstrels can do both. Some street musicians at this time of the year, happily only a few, make a little overtime as weights, and keep us in mind of the mistletoe bow. End of Street Musicians Recording by Philip Gould
Coffee Break Collection 15. The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Watercress Selling in Farringdon Market. Extract from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Published in 1851. The first Costa cry heard of a morning in the London streets, is that of French water creases. Those that sell them have to be on their rounds in time for the mechanic's breakfast, or the day's gains are lost. As the stock money for this calling need only consist of a few halfpence, it is followed by the very poorest of the poor, such as young children who have been deserted by their parents, and whose strength is not equal to any great labour, or by old men and women crippled by disease or accident, who in their dread of a workhouse life linger on with the few pence they earn by street selling. As winter draws near, the Farringdon Cress Market begins long before daylight. On your way to the city to see this strange sight, the streets are deserted. In the squares the blinds are drawn down before the windows and the shutters closed, so that the very houses seem asleep. All is so silent that you can hear the rattle of the milkmaid's cans in the neighbouring streets, or the noisy song of three or four drunken voices breaks suddenly upon you as if the singers had turned a corner, and then dies away in the distance. On the cab stands but one or two crazy cabs are left, the horses dozing with their heads down to their knees, and the drawn-up windows covered with the breath of the driver sleeping inside. At the corners of the streets the bright fires of the coffee stalls sparkle in the darkness, and as you walk along the policeman leaning against some gas lamp turns his lantern full upon you as if in suspicion that one who walks abroad so early could mean no good to householders. At one house there stands a man with dirty boots and loose hair as if he had just left some saloon, giving sharp single knocks, and then going into the road and looking up at the bedrooms to see if a light appeared in them. As you near the city, you meet, if it be a Monday or Friday morning, droves of sheep and bullocks tramping quietly along to Smithfield, and carrying a fog of steam with them, while behind, with his hands in his pockets and his dog panting at his heels, walks the sheep drover. At the principal entrance to Farringdon Market there is an open space, running the entire length of the railings in front, and extending from the iron gates at the entrance to the sheds down the centre of the large paved court before the shops. In this open space the cresses are sold, by the salesmen or saleswomen to whom they are consigned, in the hampers they are brought in from the country. The shops in the market are shut, the gaslights over the iron gates burn brightly, and every now and then you hear the half-smothered crowing of a cock, shut up in some shed or bird-fancier shop. Presently a man comes hurrying along, with a can of hot coffee in each hand, and his stall on his head, and when he has arranged his stand by the gates, and placed his white mugs between the railings on the stone wall, he blows at his charcoal fire, making the bright sparks fly about at every puff he gives. By degrees the customers are creeping up, dressed in every style of rags. They shuffle up and down before the gates, stamping to warm their feet, and rubbing their hands together till they grate like sandpaper. Some of the boys have brought large hand-baskets, and carry them with the handles round their necks, covering the head entirely with the wickerwork as with a hood. Others have their shallows fastened to their backs with a strap, and one little girl, with the bottom of her gown tattered into a fringe like a blacksmith's apron, stands shivering, in a large pair of worn-out vestrous boots, holding in her blue hands a bent and rusty tea-tray. A few poor creatures have made friends with the coffee-man, and are allowed to warm their fingers at the fire under the cans, and as the heat strikes into them, they grow sleepy and yawn. The market, by the time we reach it, has just begun. One dealer has taken his seat and sits motionless with cold, for it wants but a month to Christmas, with his hands thrust deep into the pockets of his grey driving coat. Before him is an opened hamper, with a candle fixed in the centre of the bright green cresses. 
and as it shines through the wicker sides of the basket it casts curious patterns on the ground as a nightshade does two or three customers with their shallows slung over their backs and their hands poked into the bosoms of their gowns are bending over the hamper the light from which tinges their swarthy features and they rattle their halfpence and speak coaxingly to the dealer to hurry him in their bargains just as the clocks are striking five a stout saleswoman enters the gates and instantly a country-looking fellow in a wagoner's cap and smock-frock arranges the baskets he has brought up to london the other ladies are soon at their posts well wrapped up in warm cloaks over their thick shawls and sit with their hands under their aprons talking to the loungers whom they call by their names now the business commences the customers come in by twos and threes and walk about looking at the cresses and listening to the prices asked every hamper is surrounded by a black crowd bending over till their heads nearly meet their foreheads and cheeks lighted up by the candle in the centre the saleswomen's voices are heard above the noise of the mob sharply answering all objections that may be made to the quality of their goods a rather spotty mum says an irishman as he examines one of the leaves no more spots than a new bald babe dennis answers the lady tartly and then turns to a newcomer at one basket a street seller in an old green cloak has spread out a rusty shawl to receive her bunches and by her stands her daughter in a thin cotton dress patched like a quilt oh mrs dolan cried the saleswoman in a gracious tone can you keep yourself warm it bites the fingers like barley water it do at another basket an old man with long grey hair streaming over a kind of policeman's cape is bitterly complaining of the way he has been treated by another saleswoman he bought a lot of her the other morning and by daylight they were quite white for he only made threepence on his best day well joe returns the lady you should come to them as knows you and all as treats you well as the morning twilight came on the paved court was crowded with purchasers the sheds and shops at the end of the market grew every moment more distinct and a railway van laden with carrots came rumbling into the yard the pigeons too began to fly on to the sheds or walk about the paving stones and the gas man came round with his ladder to turn out the lamps then every one was pushing about the children crying as their naked feet were trodden upon and the women hurrying off with their baskets or shawls filled with cresses and the bunch of rushes in their hands in one corner of the market busily tying up their bunches were three or four girls seated on the stones with their legs curled up under them and the ground near them was green with the leaves they had thrown away a saleswoman seeing me looking at the group said to me ah you should come here of a summer's morning and then you'd see em sitting tying up young and old upwards of hundred poor things as thick as crows in a ploughed field as it grew late and the crowd had thinned none but the very poorest of the crest sellers were left many of these had come without money others had their halfpence tied up carefully in their shawl lengths as though they dreaded the loss a sickly-looking boy of about five whose head just reached above the hampers now crept forward treading with his blue naked feet over the cold stones as a cat does over wet ground at his elbows and knees his skin showed in gashes through the rents in his clothes and he looked so frozen that the buxom saleswoman called to him asking if his mother had gone home the boy knew her well for without answering her question he went up to her and as he stood shivering on one foot said give us a few old cresses jinny and in a few minutes was running off with a green bundle under his arm as you walk home although the apprentice is knocking at the master's door the little watercress girls are crying their goods in every street some of them are gathered round the pumps washing the leaves and piling up the bunches in their baskets that are tattered and worn as their own clothing in some of the shallows the holes at the bottom have been laced up or darned together with rope and string or twigs and split laths have been fastened across whilst others are lined with oilcloth or old pieces of sheet tin even by the time the crest market is over it is yet so early that the maids are beating the mats in the road and mechanics with their tool baskets slung over their shoulders are still hurrying to their work end of watercress selling in farringdon market 
Recording by Patrick Wallace. Coffee Break 15. The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wisconsin Unemployment Benefit Decisions by Appeals Tribunals, 1942-1945. Case 42A-252, Appeals Tribunal Decision, 642. The employer denied unemployment benefits, claiming that the employee left his employment voluntarily without good cause, attributable to the employer. The commission deputy's initial determination sustained the employer's denial. The employee appealed. Findings of fact. The employee was an experienced woodsman and was employed by the employer to peel ties subsequently the employer learned through complaints from men in the mill that two young boys were working on the tie peeling job the employer investigated and found two of the employee's sons at work and the employee absent from the job the employer refused to allow the boys to continue to work because of the danger of injury at the time the employer was making his investigation the employee was at the courthouse registering for work with the representative of the public employment office on the following day the employee called at the employer's place of business and stated that he could not make any money at peeling ties that he was not going to peel ties any longer the employee never returned to the job the appeal tribunal therefore finds that the employee left his employment voluntarily without good cause attributable to the employer within the meaning of section 108.04 parenthesis 4 parenthesis b of the statutes decision the commission deputy's initial determination is affirmed benefits are denied accordingly code 16b 3b parenthesis 3 end of wisconsin employment benefits decision by appeals tribunes 1942 to 1945
even if we forget our names and houses in the finish, the secret of sleep is left us. Sleep belongs to all. Sleep is the first, and last, and best of all. People singing, people with song mouths connecting with song hearts, people who must sing or die, people whose song hearts break if there is no song mouth. These are my people. End of Work Gangs. Recording by Philip Gould. Coffee Break Collection 15 The World of Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An account of several workhouses for employing and maintaining the poor. Published in 1725. Limehouse Hamlet Stepney, June 1724. Here is a very handsome and commodious brick house built 25 years since for lodging the poor of this hamlet, but was not applied to the present use till after the act of the ninth of King George was passed to encourage the setting up of workhouses when by a subscription among the principal inhabitants it was fitted up to receive the poor and was opened april twenty eighth seventeen twenty four the number of poor now in it are as follows twenty three men and women seven boys and girls in all thirty above half of them are unfit for labor but about a dozen of them are employed in picking oakum at which they earn about four or five shillings a week in the whole which is applied toward the maintenance of the house note well old ropes are bought for five shillings the hundred weight and the oakum is sold for twelve shillings the hundred weight this steward of the house is a pensioner of the hamlet and is allowed five pounds four shillings per annum beside his maintenance and lodging etc in the house but the principal care is in eight trustees and a cashier some of whom visit the house constantly once sometimes twice a week buy provisions and give all other necessary directions as to diet they have flesh four times a week and with it such roots as are in season and the steward having been a seafaring person feeds them after the method used on shipboard that is by joining four of them in a mess and the meat is boiled in three pound pieces one of which is a mess for four persons and the same course is observed for milk bread beer etc by this rate a poor person is maintained at the rate of two shillings ten pennies or three shillings per week including all petty disbursements and incidental charges even firing and lodging not accepted, for the hamlet pay ten pounds per annum ground rent. The children in this house are all young and helpless, and therefore are sent to a school in the neighborhood at the public charge till they are eight years of age, and then they are bound out apprentices till the age of twenty-four, according to the Act of Parliament. Note well. This hamlet, with some addition, will become a distinct parish as soon as the church now building is finished. End of An Account of Several Workhouses for Employing and Maintaining the Poor Published in 1725This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. Work Which a Woman is Doing in the Slums Of aristocratic birth and associations, she devotes all her time and effort to the poor and unfortunate of New York's East Side. No respecter of creed or sect, she carries sympathy and cheer wherever she finds it is needed. Tombs Prison, a favorite field. 
There is a thick crust around the cream of society in New York that stretches from the rims on either side almost to the middle, where can be found what we are pleased to call material for missions. In these benighted quarters are to be found the outcasts, according to the version of some mission workers. And yet, those of us who are outcasts, in disrepute with those who have acquired a reputation for moral probity, must have something that is hopeful in us, must surely belong to the same human family. The trouble is to get the Pharisees to admit who are the Pharisees. The list would be as long and as distinguished as the one contained in that intensely interesting volume called Who's Who, but the publicans and the sinners have not been so favored with individualities that resound their deeds. You hear of them only through the settlement workers, the mission agents, the charitable societies, and then only in the manner of patronizing pity, of deep regret, as painful examples of depraved human nature. Occasionally, once or twice in a lifetime, you run across a man or a woman who has an almost divine sense of Christianity and insists upon a respectful appreciation of the fallen woman and the fallen man. If through some catastrophe the population of New York were brought to the necessity of eradicating class distinctions, there would be no room for the Pharisees. They would have to raise the publicans and sinners to their august level or starve alone. In the meantime, the burden of the social problem is upon the outcasts, except for the help they may receive from some distinct individuality in the person of a man or a woman ordained by providence to understand them. There are many expensive failures in the assumption of aid to these outcasts, for the best that comes to them is something they achieve for each other, the sympathy of wrong for wrong, of hunger for hunger, of the starved for the starving. A Beautiful Personality in the Slums This only by way of preliminary introduction in order that the personality of a woman who is facing the problem alone may be made comprehensive. The fact that she is an aristocrat with a title may seem to add luster to her good deeds, but she herself does not see it that way. She goes into the slums and the prisons and the mission rooms an entire stranger to everyone. I only wish to help. It really makes no difference who I am, she says if they question her. And then she sings to them with a wonderful soprano voice that has evidently been trained by some great teacher, and goes, as quietly as she came, unknown. She is tall, dark, with exceptional beauty and unwearying vigor. Her manner, her voice, her assurance are indications of her birth and breeding, though she herself would be the last in the world to observe them. She has no affiliation with any charity or mission. She works silently, quietly by personal and private contact with the outcasts. Full of a womanly pity. In private life, she is the Countess von Bus Ferrer. Her husband is a nephew of Archdeacon Ferrer, but the title is hers, not his. She is of the old German family of Bus Zewaldek. It is very difficult for me to talk about myself, she said, but I begin to see that I cannot supply all the needs that I find in my work, unless I let people know what I am doing and why I am doing it. The Countess was modestly dressed, though richly, and while admitting that her personal income was hardly big enough to take care of the interests of the poor and the unfortunate, she indicated that what she had, she gave. But the material side of her practical charity was the least feature of importance in the talk, because, although the Countess kept close to the effective means of immediate relief to the suffering, there was behind all this the remarkable fitness of woman for the task of indiscriminate pity and kindness. "'Why do you spend your time in the slums and the prisons?' she was asked. "'To the worldly wise, it would seem she is putting away from her a world of pleasure, such as is the inheritance of the fortunate ones only.' The countess smiled with a slightly disdainful, tolerant smile at the question. "'It is my way of life,' she said. "'There are other ways and other duties, perhaps, but it is my way.' "'You have always cared for the outcasts?' "'You speak of very intimate things when you ask me that. "'I believe in kindness and love above all things, "'for the unfortunate, the poor, "'the outcast by conditions that have driven them to their misfortune. "'When I was a child, if a holiday was given me, "'I would ask my father to order the carriage, "'and after filling baskets with food and clothes, "'we would spend the day together, giving them away. "'But that is a very tender recollection. "'I cannot speak about it. She brushed her eyes, suspiciously moist, with the tips of her fingers. But what some would put down to sentimentalism 
was merely evidence of a heart big enough for pity. The Countess is not at all the type of the mission worker, charitable officer, or settlement agent, because she gives first aid to the injured without question and without criticism. "'You have no religious preference?' "'None whatever. I am quite impartial,' she said, with a slightly intolerant note in her voice for the creeds that open fresh wounds in the heart of charity. "'I can go to Catholic and Protestant, Jew and Gentile, with equal purpose. "'If a man is hungry, give him food. "'If he is cold, give him clothes. "'If he is ill, nurse his poor body back to health. "'But there is danger of being deceived in all this. "'Oh, yes, but there is no mistaking hunger and exposure and sickness, is there? "'Of course I do not tell them my name, "'and I do not ask them to pray for the things they need, "'nor do I insist upon being heard while I preach. "'Spurgeon was right when he said, "'If you go out to save souls, take your pocket-book with you. "'It is not their souls you are after. "'Perhaps it does not seem so, "'but, as I believe that there is innate good in every one, "'there is really nothing to save. "'There is only to nourish and encourage "'and hearten the poor outcasts "'who in their confusion have lost the way. "'What of the hardened criminal?' "'Your hardened criminal is not such a problem "'if his enemy society will treat him with friendliness and kindness. "'If you frown upon a man, you exile him. "'If you exile him, how can he live in a community that denies him his bread? "'There are shadows of our own making, and shadows that are made for us. "'Why not destroy them with a little optimism, a little cheerfulness, "'a little faith in human nature? "'I have not been so occupied with men and women who have had long terms in prison "'as with the short-term prisoners.' the accidental criminals, the Magdalens of the street? Why are we always analyzing and condemning the fallen woman, when there is the fallen man to consider as well? Of course I make no distinction as to those I can help, but the fallen man seems to me of greater importance. Because he is the stronger, the loss to the community is the greater, and so the reason of restoring him is more satisfying. Why young men go wrong? The fallen man is redeemable? To begin with, most of our prisons are filled with young men who have done wrong because they had no one to sympathize with their lonely struggles in big cities. New York, for instance, is the center of the world's interest. Young men crowd in here from the country, from Europe, from everywhere, to gratify their ambitions, to achieve wealth and success. The little money they bring with them is soon exhausted, and they drift. Drifting is idleness, enforced idleness frequently, and then comes mischief, the temptations of environment and they get into prison, much as a bird is caught in a trap, and then there is no consoling explanation for them. The prisons have many eager, persevering, industrious young men who are amazed at their own misfortune, at the lack of sympathy which the world shows to the unfortunate. They are condemned, sentenced, and society approves without really judging the merits of the case. Are the fallen men always young? Chiefly, although in the mission rooms, where one sees the utterly disheartened and poverty-stricken specimens, there are many middle-aged men. The middle-aged man finds himself a street wreck because he has been profligate, and sometimes because he has been the victim of the society that pronounces him an outcast. The outcast and the criminal are not of one source. There is a soul in each of them, equal to the demand of every moral appeal. But how is that appeal usually made? I attended a meeting at the Bowery Mission one very wet night this week. I sang for over five hundred homeless men. They were dirty, hungry, without shelter, without sleep. The odor in the room was stifling, terrible. Well, they were preached to, urged to think of their souls and everlasting punishment for sin. Their poor souls, how could they know where they were, embedded in dirt and pain and starvation of body? When the meeting was over, they went out as they had come in, degraded outcasts of society. Where do you suppose they went? What became of them? Even the lodging houses charge what to them was a fabulous sum, since they had nothing. After nights in the street, and days in hunger and dirt, is it any wonder that they become enemies to law and order? What they need is nourishment, clothes, shelter, that they may have a chance to find out if they really have souls or not. But what of the causes that bring men to such depths? Is there any time to look into the causes of hunger until the man has been fed? It is all in the cruelty of our point of view. If we deny to these men their human right to survive, if we refuse to nourish them unconditionally, how can we hope to lift the outcast back on his feet? You know, after all, outcasts are not born. They are the wounded in battle, and we should extend to them first aid to the injured, 
without moralizing, but with the practical efficiency of a practical civilization. There is too much of the instinct to punish, too little of the instinct of mercy in the big cities. Is the breadline a sincere appeal of hungry men or of idle men? Hunger is hunger. It has nothing to do with one's morals. It has to do with the necessities of daily life. If we starve, we die, and it is more important always to live. Problem of the Breadline A man once said to me of this breadline, If I had my way, I would arrest every one of those men and fence them in and put dogs at the entrances to keep everyone away from them. That is the attitude of society toward the outcast. It is because I believe in the inherent good and the existence of a soul in all men and women that I prefer to do what I can for the outcast without asking questions. You do not exempt the criminal from his claim on your charity? The criminal is not always born, if ever. He is the weaker, the less competent, the least capable of survival in the struggle for life. He is not necessarily idle. He is merely short-sighted and singularly at sea for standards and help. The educated man who becomes an outcast is, of course, in greater danger of prison than the uneducated. A college graduate, for instance, drifts through failure to grapple successfully with the bread-and-butter problem into the slums. He spends a night or two on the streets, and he starves himself rather than let his friends know that he is in need. Presently he gets into a dreary, wandering state of mind through exposure and sleeplessness. Is it any wonder that he steals or falls into some trap that in his normal world, where he started in life, he would have seen clearly and avoided? Just think what a little food and shelter would have done for that poor fellow in time. But a term in prison is the social remedy. It is not the best remedy, if any at all. He spends three, five, seven, twelve years in confinement, and he comes out a sick and broken man. But the world looks at him askance and says, Well, if he will work harder than other men for less pay, perhaps we will reinstate him. Is he fit to work? Has society left him capable of an even footing ever again? He has been badly nourished, kept in the gloom of a stone cell without sufficient exercise, and instead of work he wants help, nursing, quiet, and a bit of hope that is cheerful. Because the doctor tells a patient after a long illness that he can sit up, he does not mean that the man can go to work. The prisons are too severe? As to that, my experience with the ex-convict does not seem to leave much doubt. I have certain plans to test the theory of environment that the criminologists insist is not so great a cause of crime as heredity. It still seems to me that there is good, much good, in every human being, so I should like to dispose of the idea of the inherited criminal instinct. I have secured from the Salvation Army a plot of ground, 75 acres, at Spring Valley, New York, where I hope to build a home for the children of criminals, a place where they will be brought up to think better of their parents than society does, where they will never be reminded of the shame that is ascribed to them, there they will attend classes in industrial labor, and in this way, perhaps, we shall attack the root and seed of criminal records. It will cost a good deal of money, and I cannot do it all myself, but it is a project in which a committee of the Salvation Army is already interested. The Countess, in quest of her solution of the criminal problem, has been visiting the tomb's prison almost daily. On Sundays, she sings to the prisoners, and as her voice has led to many offers for operatic stage, the prisoners are fortunate. She will always sing only for the outcasts, she says. Her voice and her purse belong to them. What do you sing in the missions? Always old-fashioned hymns, she said with a quiet smile. And what do you talk to the prisoners about? A countess visits prisoners. Very quietly, the countess tried to outline the detail of her work. I put my hands through the bars and shake hands with prisoners in their cells. Usually I bring with me some little dainties that they have not had the money to buy. Then I give them magazines and newspapers, but I do not intrude upon their private matters or their cases, unless they offer to talk to me about them. I never talk about religion. I merely make friends and help the unfortunates to bear the burden as cheerfully as possible. As I left this remarkable countess, with a realization that her Christianity was an unbounded field of charity, she urged upon me her regret that there should be any publicity about herself. Say nothing about me, except that I need clothes for the poor, old clothes. Thanksgiving is coming, and Christmas, and winter, and how I am going to take care of them all, I don't know. End of Work Which a Woman is Doing in the Slums